first of all, thank you everyone for being here. I submitted this uh, way time ago, so probably if you actually look into the schedule, might say eBay back then when I submitted the presentation, I was working for eBay. Now I'm working for Simon. Um, what are we going to talk about today is pretty much how we're going to manage and scale Puppet. As you know, Puppet is really, uh, can be a really simple system or really robust. So I'm going to try to take you from previous experience that I had in our companies and my actual company, where it's really um, difficult to scale because either you're sitting on PCI, you're sitting in some managed hosting, you're sitting on the cloud, or you're sitting in multiple data centers. So let's start. it. Um, it's going to be quite long, but um, let's just do it really quick. Uh, so first of all, who is this guy? Uh, my, like I said, my name is Miguel Suniga. I'm a computer guy at Simon Tech. Um, cloud, software principal engineer, whatever you want to call it. Um, eBay, in the past I've worked for eBay, PayPal, EA, Rackspace, and some others. I've been using Puppet since version 0 0.22. That was probably around 2007, 2008. Um, has matured a lot. And as for social networking, I'm not really a, a social networking guy, but uh, just think you, you want to follow me or anything, you can find me there. So let's jump into the agenda. What are we going to talk about here? Um, first of all, we're going to talk about a um, really quick intro into Puppet and Puppet Master. Scaling it with a web cluster, pretty much, I mean, for those who are really advanced users, that's, I mean, that's the common de facto. Um, but then again, there's a point where you basically just get stuck in scaling and you need more and more and more, same deal. So we're going to see how we can actually shrink that scale, that backend scale, um, using a little bit of Cache. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit of, S of source control management and Puppet, um, how to put it in multi-data center, how to do it masterless in the cloud, and what is pretty much um, moving forward, what we're basically looking at. So first of all, as you know, Puppet comes into the client and server, the Puppet, it's pretty much the client. Um, you can run it by itself, like type of masterless. Um, if you run Puppet apply with specify the manifest that you want. Um, and what it does is basically it goes over, grabs the catalog, and executes every single instruction that you specify in there. Now on the Puppet master, um, how do you basically, what are the functions? First of all, authentication become like a central authority, a CA authority for all the SSL certs that you're using. Um, it runs functions. Functions is something that um, I haven't heard much on the community, but they're really powerful um, if you actually know how to manage them. Um, basically, keep tracks of nodes. There's a lot of information that you, the Puppet Master basically contains in there, like in jump files, uh, fact files, um, SSL certs. You have no idea how much information you can get in there. And last for all, basically stores all the data that was mentioning. So moving along, this is the usual setup. You go over, install Puppet Server, install Puppet 1, 2, 3, and you write catalogs. Basically, you go over and start saying, OK, connect them to the Puppet Master. Give me the catalog, and there you go. The client gets the catalog, says, yay, let's go over and do this stuff, and um, starts putting it there. But what happens when you are in like an environment where you have multiple development teams? And I'm not talking about two, five. I'm talking about 50. This is what happens. You start rolling it out across the data center. And basically, the bottleneck, the Puppet Master, starts pretty much having a lot of complaints. You won't be able to handle the load. It depends on how much, how fast are you querying the Puppet Master for, uh, or actually reaching for the catalog. Every single time the claim connects, the Puppet Master basically compiles it and sends it back, whether it actually changed or not. Even though, I mean, it will pass over like new settings like the time and that kind of stuff. But like the actual thing that you're putting in there, if you don't need it, it will just say, you know what? Um, I'm passing over you the go install the Nagis package. I'm passing you going over install the Nagis package. So it becomes really difficult. And one of the things that I've seen on companies is that um, you start facing this problem, and pretty much you go over and say, that thing doesn't scale. And it's not that it doesn't scale. The only thing is that they don't know how to configure it. So you decide to go over and say, OK, you know what? Let's treat it as a web cluster. You go over and put a load balancer in front of it, put a lot of Puppet Masters in the back end, and one Puppet Master basically is taking care of all the CAs. 
that pretty much works really well. You start actually scaling, supporting more and more. You actually start reducing the amount of uh, intervals. Like if you are in an environment, like in a really agile environment, you'll have to, instead of running the client probably, I don't know, every hour, maybe every 30 minutes, every 10 minutes, every five. Um, the fastest that I've run the clients, probably around 2,000 servers, it's been every minute. Just to go over and do like um, continuous deployments and keep rolling patches and updates and doing some cool stuff that I'll tell you later. So what are the pros and cons of putting in a web cluster? Well, you can scale it if you have money. If you don't have money, then it's just like, okay, you know what? I don't have money to put another server in there. But if you do, then you can just keep adding and adding at the back end. It's really simple, the configuration. On this setup, you basically just have three configurations. The load balancer, if you're not using an F5 or something, it's just basically HI proxy or Apache or Nginx working as a reverse proxy. And then you have the CA, which is just the puppet master itself. And you have the other puppet masters that are actually just responding to the client's request. So a little bit of the cons, you start getting more complex. Um, if you don't have SSL termination at the load balancer, you'll have to pretty much share all the certs, everything across all the puppet masters. Usually what people do is just put an NFS share, drop all the certs in there, and then only allow the CA to actually write into that NFS share, and all of them, all of the rest are basically just written. That works pretty well. Um, the other thing is that um, on our cons, the more clients, the more load, the more money you need. Um, you can actually go over and just upgrade your server, but like I said, for a lot of companies, or if you're under a budget, it's pretty much, uh, you don't have an, an option there. So, scaling with a web cluster, what are the usual setups? The usual setup is Apache plus passenger, plus the, um, for the puppet masters, you put an HI proxy or a physical load balancer in front of it. Simple enough. Nothing more than probably like a web application setup. Then you can switch it over. You can put up Nginx, um, put a passenger on it also, and use Apache as a reverse proxy, and put mod SSL termination. That's like a cheap, poor man solution to actually create the small load balancer with SSL termination, and you're not passing the whole SSL connection all the way back to the, back, to the puppet masters and backend. And you can do pretty much the same deal with Nginx. So um, you start actually growing in your company, more teams and more teams get added and added, you added more modules, more clients, and then, hold on, let me just go back there. You go back into this problem. You have so many clients now. You have it from the, within the data center, within the managed hosting, within the lab environment, within every single piece of it, and you basically start loading, not the load balancer, you start loading the puppet masters again. Why is this happening? Because, um, I mean, probably just a qu uh, quick question here. Who from here basically have seen more than probably 2,000 connections of clients into a puppet master at the same time? Usually it gets, starts getting overloaded, right? So. That's the whole deal. The problem is that even though you start, you keep scaling, uh, the load balancer basically doesn't care, it just forwards the traffic. So if you have a catalog that are really simple, just a few resources, that's not a problem. But you, let's say you have a catalog of probably 150 resources. They'll have to figure out all the dependencies, all the requires, all the includes, and then send it over to each of those nodes that you're actually putting in there. So. Um, I started seeing this problem when I was actually running. I had to decrease the, the interval. Actually, I had to increase it to run it for production every hour and for development every 10 minutes because it was a cluster of five nodes in the back end and it couldn't handle it. I mean, they were basically dying the puppet masters. So at that point, I decided to go over and say, you know what, Passenger is basically using Puppet as a rack application. Most of the web applications, whether if it is Rack, Node.js, whatever, PHP, whatever it is, it actually benefits from a catchy layer. So I was wondering just like, probably I could just catchy the whole catalog, put it on top, like in, in front of the load balancer, or actually on the load balancer, and just let the load balancer deal with that load. 
basically just file of uh, pretty much a cache copy of the catalog that gets sent every single time to the client. So that has some good points and some bad points. One of them is that um, you're basically are reducing the load outside. The only problem is that you have to start coordinating all your nodes at the same time. If you go over and say, you know what, I'm going to introduce some cache, there's going to be a point where you make changes in the puppet code, and if you don't clear the cache, basically you never get the changes, right? I mean, obviously. Um, so that to actually go around that problem, usually you can go over and say, okay, you know what, um, every Tuesday I have a downtime window at 2 a.m. in the morning, that's when I'm actually clearing everything up. Your cluster will basically get hit a little bit, but it's going to be just in the meantime actually the cache actually warms up. So this is an example of the configuration for Nginx, which basically is doing cache layer, uh, load balancer, and pretty much SSL termination. As you can see, it's really simple. The only thing that I put in there is basically just um, the proxy pass, put it on cache, graph gets and posts, and that's pretty much it. If you're actually going over, but one of the things is that you have to do the actual specification that you're going to say, okay, four catalogs, because otherwise it will start catching everything. So you need to be aware that you have to pretty much tell it if it, something goes to like um, certificate slash certificate slash something, then don't put it on the cache and let it go into the back end. If you are going over and say, okay, I want to have an environment that is actually cached because those nodes doesn't move at all. They're just like configuration one time and they don't get anything else, put it on the cache. If you have dynamic nodes, then modify the, the Nginx configuration and just tell it for everything that goes under, I don't know, my cool dynamic environment, don't cache at all and let it pass down to the puppet masters in the same way. So um, then you pretty much are able to move from that explosion there is basically just killing you to, okay, I'm cool again. And this time, instead of having three puppet masters in backend to actually serve catalogs, I have two. So um, this actually allows you to reduce the footprint of the puppet masters and don't have to actually maintain a lot of the things that you have in there and just keep adding clients and clients and clients. Like I mentioned it before, um, the only problem you'll have is that basically you have to coordinate all the clients um, to hit over and you can probably just tell it to curl something, expire the catalog, and then actually let it run. Um, no, the, the putting down the CA root on all the three masters, um, the main problem is that um, it's, I mean, Puppet was basically designed to have its own CA root. But let's say you are using something out there or you have your own CA, it's going to be way easier to just like grab out of that CA and put it onto whatever your CA tool is and just let it actually put it in there. Um, Sharing the CA root, you can actually share it, doesn't matter at all, like I said, on the Nginx or whatever, but it doesn't actually require it because the, load, uh, the SSL termination is done at the load balancer layer. So all the traffic that goes between the load balancer and the puppet master is completely unencrypted. Single CA channel, I can't sign any new uh, For signing the new starts, you pretty much go back into that. If it has certificate, Basically, we'll go over and forward to the CA servers. So moving on. Um, so once you have that one, you pretty much are back into, into like, OK, I'm in a good state. I'm going to be able to keep adding more stuff, more stuff. So then you move forward into try to figure out how I'm going to deal with my code. And this, believe it or not, this is a huge part of actually scaling it. Because let's say you're basically going over and say, I have 10 environments. I've seen puppet configurations that they'll just go over and say, I got a new tenant on the cloud. I'm going to create its own environment. I'm going to have a new tenant and go put it on uh, a, new a, new environment, a new environment. So then you end up managing, instead of three, like development stage and production, you end up managing like tenant A stage, tenant A production, tenant B development, tenant C production. So it becomes really messy. Uh, but one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that always put it on the SCM. It's always simple to just go over and say, I'm going to git clone or git pull into any of the puppet masters than actually shipping every, anything else. You know, you can do like SBN if you want. That's not a problem. It's the same deal. So the less environments you have, the better. Why I'm saying this, 
it's way better to just have three environments where you basically have one for development and you go and drop everything in there. Doesn't matter if it is like for a thousand teams. Um, at the end, the, each of the different modules can be pretty much arranged to the specific needs of those teams. You can create classes in there, you can create classes and call, their, and call them roles, you can create classes and call them profiles, whatever you want. Um, but then, going over with a few environments, you can use actually the same way that you're developing any other application. You test it on development, pass it over, merge it into the test environment. I mean, you pretty much go to development, that passes, you're cool, merge that changes into the test environment, you have your own nodes actually running their test and whatever, I mean, to actually see um, everything that is getting applied. That passes, then the next downtime window, you can actually roll it up into production. That will allow you to just keep a really simple way of m migrating between the different uh, development, between the different environments. And not only that, um, it works pretty well with stuff like ITIL and change management. Because it's simple uh, when you have the whole bunch of audits, you don't have to go over and say, oh, but I have this environment that I might do something, and I have this other environment that I might do this sort of stuff. So it's just simple stuff, everything goes in there, everyone makes it happy. Um, the other thing, make the local decisions at the classes. Don't put any logical stuff within the modules. I mean, the modules, like most everyone knows, is just like for the module. If you're putting an NTP module, drop it in there in the module. Don't put anything crazy like, if I have this IP or if I have this other GRA or if I have this factor, then go over and deploy this, 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 no. Create the module, create your own classes, do the logical thing in there. It's gonna be easier to actually when you're trying to debug what, what exactly is going on. Um, some of the things that, I, I mean, this is only point of view of mine. I'd rather use requires than includes. Why? Because when you require something, you're pretty much putting a dependency of something else. Whether if it is in include, it means that, well, it's also a dependency, but it doesn't mean that it's gonna get executed before. So if you go with requires, you basically start coding in a way that is more like recursive because you're, base, you're, you're requiring one module and then you can require another module after that, one's, after that one is actually finished and then actually do everything that you need to do in your class. Um, virtual resources are always fun. I mean, I know that a lot of you probably go to Puppet Force and just download the Puppet module and go and try to use it. But you, I think you already seen like name clashing between Puppet modules in Puppet Force. So that's really common. Um, in those cases, uh, I decided to go with virtual resources. Why? Because it doesn't matter which module is, I just realize it in there and it's good to go. More difficult to track, um, but it's actually worth it. I mean, you pretty much end up putting all your system accounts into a virtual users file and then you can realize any of them in any of your classes or any of your models that you need in there. And pretty much manage dependencies. The managing dependencies is pretty much tied with using requires. Um, one of the things that I usually go over and tell like all the other teams that are doing Puppet is imagine that you're deploying a service every single time. Whether if it is gonna be just a module that is gonna configure your, your network interface or you're gonna configure NTP. Imagine it that you're basically putting a, a, a service or actually installing also some, some service. What would you usually do? First, put out like all the repositories in place, then go over and install, specify which installation packages, then actually configure it and then enable the service. Do the same deal to actually do it a little bit better and have more uh, a little bit more structure. You could go into each of the Puppet modules and say, okay, I have my init.pp, which basically calls like the install.pp, then the config.pp, post-config.pp, and then the last one gets called is service.pp. Same deal, you just put out a bunch of requires, one, of, uh, one after the other. So in that case, um, for that example, the install.pp is the first one that gets called because that one's required by the config and that one at the same time is required by the service. And the init.pp is the one that requires the service. See what I mean? It goes all the way back into like a, circ a circle. Um, so moving on, let's say that now you have your setup or your cluster actually handles the load really well. You put everything into Git, into SVN, 
and you're replicating everything. You have a really good structure on how you're actually putting everything in there. Um, you know that basically if you need a new development team that is actually getting on board, you'll just create another class for that specific development team. All the, mo all the modules are, are shared between all the classes, so you're good to go. Um, how you actually manage multi-data center? First of all, put out cache servers in each of them. Um, we, I and previous coworkers would used to deploy a Puppet Master on each of the data centers. And then a Puppet Master that has its own modules. And out of the nothing, somebody decided to go over and make a change in there. And everything's out of sync, you know, because you have your central repository here, and then you have this snow, pretty much this snowflake that you actually start adding and adding more stuff. Forget about it. It's just like you're using SEM, make all the changes into the SEM, and let it replicate. Um, distribute the caching servers is pretty much just to give you the option of have caching on every of them. Like I said, it's the same configuration that I put up before. You just basically go over and just replicate the configuration. Changes IP addresses probably, but then again. I mean, if you want to go over and just make it even simple uh, or simpler, uh, you can just go over and put a, like a dynamic DNS views and one CNAME, I mean one um, FQDN for all your infrastructure. And the dynamic DNS and with views basically takes care of actually resolving the proper IP depending on the data center that you are. Um, use SEM to replicate code, like I said. Um, I usually go over and put out to replicate the Puppet code every two minutes. Every two minutes, each of those Puppet Masters is basically pulling, or actually, yeah, pulling from source. I use Git, so I'm sorry if I go over and put in there. Uh, the other thing, um, use something to actually input the data into the Puppet Masters. If you're using something like Foreman, well, pretty much that ties with the Puppet Master really well, grabs the data out of it. But if you're using, like, for instance, Cobbler, or just bare simple Kickstart, at the end, which is fine, well, it's the same deal, sorry. Um, at the end, just put out something that will basically either put all your stuff into PuppetDB, and not actually put your stuff into PuppetDB. Put your stuff into Foreman or basically just create the node configuration file for that specific server that you're building at that point and let it actually put it on an NFS share where, they, where it can actually get it, the Puppet Master, the main Puppet Master, the central one, or just make it to commit it back to get into your bunch of code of Puppet. Um, the other thing is um, really good, and this is just, it depends, you know. Um, but ha define downtime windows. Why is it good, this? Because um, a really easy and simple way of doing it is that um, you can have stuff like the, um, development, or actually you put your code in development and let it sit there for a week. Go over and talk to your change management people over there and say, you know what, I'm going to have this code running here for a week. Um, the next Wednesday or the next Friday at 2 a.m. in the morning, Somebody's making the merge between development and testing. Same deal for development from testing to production. So you pretty much can get something already like pre-approved, which you can just go over and say, put it on a script in the back end. Forget about having somebody to actually merge it locally. I mean, at the end, if something goes bad, you recover it. You have the downtime window that everybody knows. You don't have to deal with anything. Um, now, for the same thing goes into like if you're uh, class specifically to clear catches at the downtime window. Um, what I meant by this running into like a class is basically just put a cron job that makes a curl to your same cluster. Doesn't have to be the puppet client, just put a curl symbol and tell it to clear the catchy. I mean, Nginx will be able to deal with it. You will see the actual extra header. It will clear it up for you. And as always, remember that standardization is the same. It's the best thing you can do. Managing something so big with so many different classes, profiles, roles, whatever you want to call it, is pretty much really difficult to track down. So um, at the beginning, I mentioned it that there's a lot of data you can grab from the Puppet Master. You can basically query the API to figure out which nodes are up and down. You can go over and say, OK, give me all the factors and put those into Mongo. And you have now all the factors stored into a, a database or you can put them into solar and just make them search. Um, use functions if you're actually having a lot of backend things. Um, the thing with functions, and the reason why I mention it is because usually functions run on the Puppet Master and then sends the data back to the clients. Mm. If you don't have, like in the case that you're, let's say, PCI, 
and you wanted to go over and say, the only thing that I get approved to talk for those clients out of the PCI environment is to the Puppet Master. If you write a function that's going to go over and tell you, okay, tell me what's the time in China right now, or tell me what's the time in Australia or something there, the server will basically run that function for you and pass it over, whether if it is some variables or a factor or something else. And you have your information now inside of the whole PCI environment without actually breaking anything because everything is going through the Puppet Master. Um, so let's say that that was probably a while ago. Now the cloud. Everyone wants to go around and tell, OK, let's jump into a cloud. First thing, certs, they always kill you. You start going over, say, OK, I'm cool. I'm inside of AWS. Um, out of the nothing, oh my god, my VM just died. AWS decided to kill it. I'm going to bring it back. It doesn't have the same cert. Or you actually, if you store the cert into the, into the image itself, you're basically on uh, the puppet master will say, who are you? I mean, oh, I already had that cert with this other client, so I'm, you're not going to work it. So how do you deal with this? This is where pretty much everyone has heard about masterless. You just either clone your things into your client, ramp up and apply on all of them, and you just keep working with Puppet, with, uh, Puppet without the masterless thing. But even though it's a good approach, if you want to be able to track down your servers later, or actually if you have, let's say you have a VM that it's been up there in the cloud for, I don't know, two months, and you need to roll out new, new changes into it, what is going to be, in, what would actually be simple? Just tell the Puppet Master to go over and roll it out the new change into it, or you go over and do everything manually or through some script or trying to figure out some orchestration layer or something else, uh, like, I don't know, run salt or whatever, to actually go into that specific server and just tell it, pop it, apply, blah. So um, even though a lot of people run it in cron jobs, still, um, it's way simple to just go over and create a bootstrap script, uh, a bootstrap script that basically you can talk to the master to the um, HTTP API of the of the Puppet Master with a basic cert that only allows that specific thing and query if it actually exists. If it doesn't exist, then you're good to go. Go ahead, run it, and at the end, make sure. I mean, you're probably going to go over and start deploying things like your LDAP configurations, NTP configurations, uh, your basic repositories if you're using something private. Um, but at the end, tell it to go over and plug it back to the Puppet Master. Simple as that. Service, go over and inst uh, Puppet D, make sure the ensure is running. And there you go. That way, if you actually have to roll out changes later on down the road, you're going to be able to just do it from a central point, which at the end is the whole point of having the Puppet server. It's just like you're basically telling all the nodes that whether you are on physical servers or in the cloud, just go over and just um, update their state. So um, maintain the sales through querying the cloud or CMDB. That's something that we had to went over and pretty much put out there. Um, it, it's really common in the cloud. They'll basically go over and say, you know what, I just killed the VM. The developer killed the VM. Somebody else killed my VM. And you end up with a bunch of servers. So it's really difficult to track it. So it, one of the things that is really good to go over is just put out something that is actually querying. In case of AWS, we're just basically going over and saying, um, is it to describe instances? And give me everything, all the information. Parsing the XML output. And based on that one, we're basically just going over in the back end and telling the Puppet Master, all these servers, just get rid of all those uh, CA files all of, from all the certs. Why is that the reason? I mean, whether you want it or not, if you have a lot of control on how the infrastructure works, then good. You could probably find a good naming convention that is never going to actually overlap with something else. You could probably go over and say, put the UUID in front of it, and then name it whatever you want. A lot of big companies, hosting companies, they actually do that. They'll basically just go over and say, put these six characters on top and deploy whatever your name you want in there. And they do it for a reason. Because if somebody comes back and say, OK, I'm going to name it my cool server, and then that dies and goes back and say, OK, my cool server, um, your CMDV is going to be bad. Not only your Puppet Master is going to be bad, everything's going to be either. Somebody sooner or later will go over and say, that thing not supposed to be there, kill it. And you just put out production down for, I don't know, probably two days. So things happen, you know. Um, so this is one thing that. Uh, we had to go through it at the beginning when we were experimenting with AWS, which is not really recommended. 
we grab one cert, and that cert we apply it to all the images. It works, but it's really horrible the first time you actually lose that cert, or you actually make it um, or expires. All your clients out of the nothing, they'll stop. In our case, um, not only the Puppet Master is using those certs. We usually use the certs of the Puppet Master for LDAP certification, for LDAP connections, OpenVPN connections, and a bunch of things that we usually go over and put in there. Because at the end, I mean, we didn't have a CA cert back then, like a CA, a proper CA tool. So the Puppet Master worked really, really well. But anyway, um, moving on. So what is next? What are we, what I'm actually working on right now? First of all, search function. Um, this is pretty much tied up to using functions in the Puppet Master. Why? Because um, one of the things that I've been trying to automate is let's say that you're in the process of putting an HI proxy and you have to add nodes and remove nodes on the fly as soon as your application actually scales. With a serve function, basically you can just go over and say, give me everything, like I said, from the solar server that has a factor that's called the Puppet node is ready. So that pretty much gets sent into the catalog itself from the Puppet Master. And then you can just go over and tell it on the actual, on one module that goes over and reconfigures HI proxy at every single server that comes through like with the flag, yes, the node is ready. That way, the next time that Puppet runs, let's say that you crash two of those backend servers, it will, instead of sending five, it will send three. And Puppet basically takes care of reconfiguring HI proxy for you, restarting HI proxy for you with a subscribe, and you're good to go. You don't have to deal, not even, you don't even have to worry about it. It's just something that will be living by itself in the back end. Um, so what are we basically using and actually putting that? Um, we're actually seeing that um, the Puppet basically goes over and you, we don't have Puppet TV right now, or actually on my setup, I don't have Puppet TV. I actually grab in all the fact jams that basically are getting collected. And that's simple, just put it on solar. It's really simple. There is, I mean, solar was designed to actually deal with documents. So the performance is really, really good. And like I said, the use cases that I have is, for instance, discover new nodes in the case of HI proxy, semi-orchestrate, deploying OpenStack, really difficult task. You have to go over and deploy a bunch of compute nodes. And then, oh wait, you need to wait until, kill, until Keystone is up and running. What if you had the serve function in there and say, OK, go over and deploy everything, but don't finish the configuration until Keystone is up. You have pretty much semi-orchestrated that at the point where you don't need to go over and put something else. Yeah, you could go over and deploy M Collective, but at the end, um, it's another layer to orchestrate something. Whether this way, we would actually just like let it run, let it spin up the servers, and let them figure it out themselves. Um, the other thing that we're putting in there is basically notification base of dynamic re resources, same deal. If something says that, uh, you know what, I figured out that there are two more um, servers that shouldn't be there, okay, send me a notification or a notified or something else. Uh, and the example of the HI proxy that I put in, in that case. Um, and that's pretty much everything that I have. So I cannot believe I didn't talk for the 40 minutes. But anyway, um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach me at all. What is the search function again? The search? The reason is that um, usually you go over, usually you go over and this one, the search, right? The whole idea is that the Puppet Master will have a function in the back end where you can just specify it. Go and search me all the catal all, all the nodes that have a specific factor or a specific thing that you have. So you're grabbing all the factors from the Puppet Master, putting them in Solar which basically you could probably start searching anything in there. And then you just create the function in the Puppet Master saying, search for something in there. You got to know pretty much a little bit of Puppet internals because at the end you end up creating a provider or something like that and putting some Ruby code in there to actually search solar. But solar is what? No, solar, you could use your CMDB if you want. You can use a database if you want. If you're using LDAP nodes, you can go over and use it. I mean, it's pretty much open to anything. The only reason why I'm using Solar is because I'm dropping like the fact jumps that the Puppet Master collect, as it is, into the Solar server. The Solar server is an Apache search indexer service. Um, so it actually, um, 
allows me to do things way easier than going over and deploying the same or reading each of those fact jobs and then deploying them into a database. If you have PuppetDB, you could probably just do it really simple on querying PuppetDB, PuppetDB and just bring back the, the whole deal. Um, but at the end, we tried it going over and saying, okay, instead of using the functions from the Puppet Master, go over and use something on the client that goes over and talks to that specific, like talks to PuppetDB or talks to some search engine or talks to Mongo to actually figure out the data. The only problem is that if you have multiple environments, plug it up by a bunch of firewalls, it's not gonna happen. So you start falling into like, you need to open the, the actual ACL from every single node into there or just put out your service open to everyone. It depends on how your, your environment is set up or where you're actually deployed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, so the deal, um, I'm gonna just repeat your question. The, pretty much the question was, how do I differentiate between a master list and an actual client? Um, the reason is that during the boot process, if you're spinning up something in AWS, um, during the first initial boot up, I mean, if you're using WriteScale, for example, to spin up something or something, or you have some other tool out there, uh, master list will run just the first time on boot. Just pretty much tell it to run the first time. At the end, I mean, that will pretty much grab the basic stuff from you that you have to configure in there, like SSH keys or whatever. But at the end, put a small class that basically says, like, uh, not, a, not even a class, a package that basically says, package um, Puppet D uh, or Puppet Demon, whatever you're gonna, you're gonna call it, um, ensure running. Before that one, just make sure that you have your Puppet configuration pointed to the actual master. See what I mean? It's just like a bootstrap that basically pre-configures the system, and at the end, you're just telling it, okay, the last step, go over and put it and plug it back to the Puppet Master. I thought you were talking about running the master with perpetually. No, oh, I mean, there's that option, uh, but like I said, it, it has so much more benefits of actually grabbing everything and drop it into the Puppet Master, because you, you can actually control the stuff, you can query the stuff, so, I mean, it's, it depends, you know? I mean, it's, it's different options. I mean, and yeah, yeah. Quick question. When you tell you refer in terms of scaling with the web cluster and that you're concerned with about 2,000 servers, are they global or they all work? Um, it depends. Um, the thing is that uh, if it is global, let's say you have multiple environments, um, you have two options. You can go over and deploy one into each environment and point those clients into it directly. Or you can actually have like a global C name and use bind views. What is basically bind is doing is that depending on from which network you come in, it will resolve a different IP. Right, okay. So pretty much you go over and say, okay, I only have one name that is called my puppet cluster, my domain.com. No matter where they are sitting, um, you're, you pretty much are going over to different puppet servers at the end, right? Yeah. But the whole result part is, is just one. So it actually allows you to simplify all the deployment way better because you don't have to be chasing, okay, which is the IP of the Puppet Master in my data center X, or which is the actual FQDN of the data center V, or exactly what was the Puppet Master that I have running in the cloud in, in US East, or what is exactly running on HP. See what I mean? I mean, it doesn't matter where they are basically running, you'll end up having one, just like one FQDN for all the Puppet Masters, which uh, the DNS takes care of actually giving you the proper IP where you need to go to. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, since you guys are doing intermix caching, um, how do you guys split? Like, how do you avoid caching the same data? How do I? How do I what? How do you avoid caching the same data across multiple intermix clusters? So, on that point, right now we haven't actually gone through it because since uh, we basically are deploying uh, like a cluster for each of the different ones, and then we have the view DNS thing that basically takes care of saying, you know what, this server goes to this cluster, even though it's using the same name, it will just go there. So we're basically having um, all the same stuff for the servers at that point. 
uh, we're not like a huge cache across the all the environments and everything, you know? I um, mean, it's just like the, the FQDM basically takes care of it. The problems that I've seen with the, with the cache stuff, uh, and the reason why we went to Nginx was that it's the only thing that actually caches post. So it was really, really switched, you know, because before we were using Apache uh, mod proxy, then the Apache of Apache, and it was working fine up to 3.3, I think, where they switch it over or something like that. Um, on the other side, since it's basically just data that we're catching over and over and over, and we're not using any facts at all, like in any specific facts, like um, time facts, or like give me exactly what's the time of the factor or something like that, we don't really care. The only thing that we care though is that um, we're basically deploying the same packages and same packages. It's just basically caching to offload. Um, I mean, we're basically just offloading this, the load from the Puppet Masters. So, not sure. Yeah? Again, which contexts are um, cacheable? Which, uh, you can catch everything, everything that you want. Um, the only thing is that uh, the only stuff that is recommended to catch is the catalogs, what is like under slash catalog. Um, you can catch also slash nodes, but it depends whether if you have something in the back end um, that is actually using that specific section. Um, slash certificates, those are, you have to let them go because they'll basically just need to, if you have a new server, um, or if by X, Y, or Z, the actual uh, certificate has to expire, the cache will keep it there. So, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm actually, I'm out of time now. So if any have, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to reach me after it. Um, but thank you.